Well, hello everybody, Dr. David Perlmutter here. Looks like we are live. Let me do a little camera adjustment. And welcome to everybody. Um, got a lot of interesting things that I'd like to cover today. And first, I'd like to say uh, what a nice response to the interview we just posted with Dr. Jeffrey Bland on immunorejuvenation, on the idea that our immune systems age with time and how we can affect that, we can regenerate uh, immunocompetence, which I think is really very exciting. Uh, that's what he reviewed in his time with me. Uh, I think if you uh, will look at the um, interview, it's posted here on Facebook, but also maybe get in the habit of starting to visit the uh, channel, the Empowering Neurologist or Dr. David Pomutter uh, channel on YouTube. We've posted everything there and uh, seeing a lot of great uh, Great comments. So we're going to get started. I, I see some flashing of my image here. I'm not sure what that means, but anyhow, we're going to get started. Lots of interesting things to, to cover. Um, I think the latest breaking news from this morning uh, is the uh, announcement of the research coming out of Oxford uh, at the uh, Jenner, Jenner Laboratory by Professor Hill. Uh, demonstrating that uh, they may be well ahead on the development of a vaccine. And in this case, what they're working on is kind of changing the genetics of an existing non-threatening respiratory virus in order to make it look like uh, this COVID-19 virus in terms of our immune response. The exciting news is that they may be able to provide a vaccine one heck of a lot sooner than the so-called year to 18 months that uh, we've heard about. That this vaccine already tried in uh, macaque monkeys, which are uh, apparently very, very close to humans, uh, and showed uh, only in six monkeys, but showed incredible ability to protect them against uh, being infected by very high dosages of coronavirus uh, exposure. Now, <clears throat> I'm certain that we are gonna get uh, que uh, questions about immunizations and vaccines and also comments, some of which will be negative, and that's okay. Uh, everybody has to make up, I think, their own minds in terms of how they feel about immunizations and vaccines. My mission here is simply to present the news. I am very uh, taken by a kind of a new step that these researchers are exploring in terms of uh, looking at this whole idea of enhancing our immune uh, response. Um, <clears throat> there was also some announcement yesterday that Pepsid, the over-the-counter drug Pepsid, but obviously using the generic form, is being researched at one hospital as a way of limiting the um, uh, worse outcome uh, and people affected. My concern about the use of Pepsid or any acid-reducing uh, medication is the effects that it might have on the gut bacteria that might not be necessarily positive. When we change the microbiome, we know that we can actually increase inflammation. Um, there's also an announcement today of some research being done looking at hormones. The idea being that, look, we know that men have a significantly worse outcome probability as it relates to COVID infection in comparison to women. Why not treat uh, men with female hormones? I think it's an interesting prospect, but I would say the following. We should stop using the idea of the term male and female hormones. What is a male hormone? Testosterone? Well, women's bodies need and use testosterone uh, as well. Male bodies use and uh, produce estrogen and progesterone as well. So the notion that these are male and female hormones, I think, is a little bit narrow-minded. Similarly, we know that uh, gallbladder hormones like cholecystokinin have effects within the human brain. So by virtue of the fact that we name these hormones <clears throat> and other chemicals in the body, uh, tends to lock us into how we think about them. Like the neurotransmitters, serotonin and norepinephrine and dopamine, do a variety of things throughout the body beyond just acting in the brain. So as we move past that, I think it will open up the door for us to really get our arms around the fact that these <clears throat> chemicals in the human body do a lot of different things uh, that we should embrace. Um, we uh, today are looking at the idea that various states are opening themselves up. And if you're interested in how I feel about that, 
<clears throat> I think it's not going to be as bad as perhaps we had worried. Uh, that what we see happening is that, yes, states like Georgia are opening. Uh, there's an idea to even open schools, but we see uh, opening up um, tattoo uh, places and um, even uh, ability to have your hair done and going to have a massage and restaurants opening at a level of 25%. I think, yeah, there's reason to be concerned because we know that social distancing is so darn important. But I would say that uh, my sense is that, yes, we may see a spike in cases, but it may not be as bad as we had worried about <clears throat> because I think that we're seeing people still uh, embracing the notion of social distancing, even in these uh, scenarios. So uh, is that the real Paige Forbes from uh, Coral Gables High School? I sure hope so. Uh, anyway, I'm uh, seeing a lot of familiar names uh, on the, on the uh, stream, so that's... Uh, that's really uh, great to connect with people. Hello from Peru. Uh, we'll get back to some of these ideas. And um, so let's then talk about what can really help us open up states across our nation uh, in a safer way. And it comes down to one word, and you know what I'm going to say, and that is testing. Well, we've been looking recently, as in the past couple of days, um, at the evaluation of the so-called antibody testing in terms of how effective it is and what is the rate of false positive and false negative. And it, it seems like there's at least about in general in the antibody testing, a um, about a 4% to 6% false positive rate. What does that mean? It's a, the testing saying that you are positive, you've had the antibodies, and the implication then is that you're safe to go out and do your thing, right? Well, if you're part of four or six percent of people who are told, hey, you can go back to work or don't worry about wearing the mask anymore, you're home free, you've got immunity, and you really don't because it's a false positive test, maybe because you had a previous coronavirus infection, which are in fact very common uh, in our society, then that's not going to be a good thing for you because then you might uh, contract the virus and have a bad outcome. It looks though that on uh, the basis of a lot of the new literature showing how widespread this notion of asymptomatic carrier, asymptomatic exposure really is. One study out of Chelsea, Massachusetts published a couple of days ago showed that a third of the population in this city had antibodies, meaning that a lot of people are asymptomatic or at least pre-symptomatic. The upside of that is the following. We determine the death rate of this virus by taking the number of proven people who are who have been affected or positive divided by the number of people who die. That's the death rate. It turns out there's a lot more people than are testing positive who have actually contracted COVID. So therefore, the death rate is going to be a lot lower. That's great. When we started our time together doing these uh, updates, you know, the information we were getting out of China was three to 5% uh, death rate if you've got coronavirus. Now it's certainly south of 1%, and I would say significantly south of 1%. That's great news. Believe me, uh, that's really uh, great news. So let's turn to the news, as if uh, that wasn't the news already. Our first, uh, the first thing we're going to talk about, and let me tell you, there's uh, some kind of new things that we're doing I am adding um, I'm adding this announcement ahead of time in terms of what we're going to uh, be covering, so that if you have questions, post them uh, as a comment uh, where I announce the upcoming uh, topics for the day. So I just posted uh, the topic for, that we're going to cover right now, and this is a, a study or a, a, an opinion letter that came out called "Underinvestment in the Health of the U.S. Population." in the context of COVID-19. We have to acknowledge that, as this research tells us, that at the core, uh, unfortunately, the truth of the matter is the United States population is unhealthier overall than many of our peer countries. Uh, we have the highest rate of chronic disease in comparison to other member nations in what is called the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development the OECD countries. We know that the United States has twice the obesity rate 
of the OECD average, the other countries. I am simply calling it as it is in the context of COVID-19. Why? Because obesity is a powerful risk factor, as we talked about with Dr. Bland uh, in the post from Sunday, a powerful risk factor for an adverse outcome. Um, the United States had lagged behind its years in life expectancy for the past four decades. I didn't say years. I said decades that life expectancy in our country has lagged behind our, uh, our peers. Uh, and we currently have the highest number of hospitalizations for preventable diseases and the highest number of avoidable deaths among our peer nations. Uh, so we know that underlying health in America isn't great. I'm calling it like it is. These are statistics put out by multiple organizations. And unfortunately, this fact has been one of the explanations in terms of why so many Americans are having bad outcomes as it relates to COVID-19 infection. As I discussed with Dr. Bland in the interview that was posted Sunday, two days ago, these issues, hypertension, obesity, type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease are at their core inflammatory disorders. They are disorders characterized by compromise of the immune function. It's an aging of the immune system that leads to these issues, much as we see posing a risk for bad outcome with respect to COVID-19. So the empowering part of what we're talking about today is that these are diseases of lifestyle choice. My point is that now is the time to redouble our efforts in doing the, the things that we know are helpful with respect to lifestyle, diet, exercise, sleep, meditation, all the things that we know are helpful for reestablishing better functionality of our immune systems are also associated with less a likelihood of these diseases and even improvement in these conditions. So while we're waiting for better treatments discovered, or perhaps you're waiting uh, for a vaccine or immunization program, there are things to do right now to improve your odds of having a better outcome if you get this infection. Uh, you might be in a high risk uh, uh, group. I am because I'm 65 and therefore you want it. I, I want to double down on uh, my, my efforts to really keep my health as uh, in the best shape I possibly can. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, something that I think that's really interesting. It's a study uh, and I'll get to these questions in just a moment. I see there's uh, more today probably than ever uh, comments. Thank you for those. And what I just posted is called Obesity hypoventilation syndrome and severe COVID-19. Now, I'm not going to present this because of the obesity connection. I simply am going to present this study because of what it tells us is going on in, um, in China in terms of how they approach uh, a patient. I, so I read this case report first because of how this uh, underventilation syndrome that is characteristic of obesity plays out. But more importantly, I want to just read to you how this patient was treated because I think it's really instructive. So here, case report of a 23-year-old, a young person who was hospitalized in China on January 21st uh, of this year. He had five days of fever, chills, headache, nasal congestion, cough, and mild shortness of breath. Um, and is admitted to the hospital, uh, tested for COVID-19, throat swab positive, polymerase chain reaction testing positive. Okay, but here are some of his medical conditions, and I think this is really very instructive. instructive. He has metabolic associated fatty liver disease, what we call here in America, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We talked about that uh, several weeks ago. He has obstructive sleep apnea, uh, and he has a body mass index, which is high at 37. Obstructive sleep apnea means he's not sleeping well. That's a powerful influence on immune function. It, it, it might explain why there's such a strong relationship between obesity and risk of poor outcome with COVID-19. 
<clears throat> the point is you can do something about it. Maybe it means you need to do CPAP uh, and as well lose weight because one of the issues that relates to overweight and obesity in terms of immune function is how it affects our sleep. And as we talked about in Brainwash, how poor sleep affects decision making. So if you want to make better decisions the next day as it relates to your diet, as it relates to exercise, etc., do your very best to get a good night's sleep. But here's why this study I think is so important. It's actually a case report. Here's what I took from it. How was this young man, 23 years of age, treated? First, they gave him uh, interferon treatments. Uh, interferon is a way of enhancing immunization. And further, interestingly, COVID-19, this virus, is able to degrade our body's production of a, a form of interfer interferon that aids our immune function. That's a pretty stealthy virus. Uh, that, that's not fair that it does that, but it does do that. It degrades that part of our immune system, uh, how we produce interferon. So uh, in this uh, intervention, the Chinese decided, let's use interferon, giving it twice a day. Next thing, they went ahead and gave this man, as part of the standard of care, uh, antiviral treatment in the form of two antivirals, lopinavir and ritinavir. Uh, which uh, is what they consider standard of care, and also oral Arbidol, A-R-B-I-D-O-L. Now, I've talked a lot about Arbidol uh, before. This is an antiviral medication that has a proven track record, very effective in other viral infections, used in Russia, used in China for many years. Um, clearly uh, not known how effective it's going to be in this case, but I did present some data on this uh, a few days ago showing that Arbidol in comparison to lopinavir, ritinavir in one study was shown to be very effective, far more effective. Uh, and that's why I present this because, you know, it looks like in China and likely in other countries, they are on board uh, with going ahead and using these treatments, uh, which have not necessarily uh, been proven. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is this very powerful report that appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association, just appeared. When we finish this, I will take questions and answer comments. So I just posted the link. Um, this is a study uh, that looks at, um, I'll read you the title, Presenting Characteristics, Comorbidities, and Outcome. That's what we're going to focus on. 5,700 patients admitted to hospitals in New York. 12 different hospitals looking at 5,700 patients. And this is what you want to know. What in the heck happens to these, this very large sample of patients who are admitted to the hospital? Uh, New York's a great place uh, because it had so many hospital admissions, but in multiple hospitals, not just necessarily in Manhattan. And this is a looking at what happens to these people who get admitted to the hospital uh, over a five week period of time, March 1st through April the 4th, all people in the study were tested using a polymerase chain reaction studies, nasopharyngeal swab and proven positive. And this is what they learned. First, that 40% um, of the patients admitted to the hospital were female, meaning 60% of the people admitted to the hospital are male. Now that gets back to this notion of perhaps using uh, hormones uh, in treating male patients because we know that hormones affect immune function. Uh, you can read about that today. It's certainly in the news. Um, about a third, about 30% of these people admitted to the hospital require supplemental oxygen. And uh, now we're going to look at the outcomes of this group of people. Outcome means they were either discharged or they passed away. And uh, of that group, uh, we're looking at outcomes in 2,634. So about half of them uh, were either discharged or they had died. Now the median age is 68. That's not the average, it's the median. It means half of the people's ages was before was lower and half of people's ages was higher. If you don't understand uh, median 
and uh, mean, these are different terms. So we have mean, median, and mode. You might want to look that up. So here's really a very interesting take home message that 12% um, of the people admitted to the hospital required invasive mechanical ventilation, it means they were put on a ventilator. 12% chance you're admitted to the hospital, you're going to go on a ventilator. Now, what does that mean? It means that there is a strong likelihood that you won't, that, you know, you'll have a, you'll be in bad shape, that uh, we know that only, um, you know, about 30 to 40%, that's being generous, the people on a ventilator will survive. But here's something else I want you to understand, and this is very important news moving forward, that of the people who ended up in the intensive care unit, 3.2% require dialysis. Think about that. There's a lot of talk about how many ventilators we need. Who's going to make ventilators? Gratefully, Ford and, and General Motors are making ventilators. And we seem to have enough currently of ventilators to go around because it was recognized early on that the main thing that happens to people when they're put in the hospital and uh, in the intensive care unit is they have difficulty oxygenating their blood. Therefore, there was this huge worry we wouldn't have enough ventilators. Now it looks as if, as we've talked about, that the kidneys are a target as well, and that requires a special type of machinery as well, and that is dialysis uh, machines, as well as trained uh, individuals who can do dialysis treatment. That's a specialty as well. So 3.2% of people in the hospital intensive care unit are requiring dialysis. I can't give you good statistics as yet as to uh, how many of these people long term are going to require dialysis. But think about that. It's not just that they're requiring ventilators, but dialysis as well. What I'm hoping happens is that we step up our production of dialysis machinery as well. Uh, the good news is that unlike being on a ventilator, uh, you don't need the dialysis uh, device all the time. You get dialyzed, and then they can use that de device uh, with other people. Um, so let me move on and look at some of your, <laughs> I've seen many of these already, some of these very interesting uh, uh, questions. Okay. Okay, here we go. Why do hospitals use uh, IV glutathione or high dose vitamin C? Why do they or why don't they? I'm not sure, uh, Julie Thompson uh, Lyons, what that question is, but uh, IV vitamin C is not something that's very typical for hospitals to use. Uh, intravenous glutathione, uh, oddly enough, uh, is something that is used for detoxification in hospitals and um, in certain circumstances, and even uh, N acetylcysteine is used for patients with acute pulmonary specific issues uh, that we see associated, for example, with cystic fibrosis. Now, there is uh, a, a study, but probably several, that we are looking at um, that, re that are looking at intravenous vitamin C as a treatment uh, to be done in hospital uh, for people who are having uh, having bad uh, situation with reference to COVID. Now, uh, let me just look through some more of these uh, questions. Thank you for all who are saying, uh, thanking me for the time and research. Um, let me see. There is a lot of choppiness in my audio. Not sure you can do anything about it, but it's distracting. Yeah, I'm noticing that. It is what it is today. I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to redo this, but we'll, we'll see if it's better tomorrow. Um, okay. Um, all right. And, uh. Okay, give me just a moment. Um, interesting a comment. Well, no, I can't do that. Uh, uh, I, I can't. I can't go there. Anyway, uh, I, the, the the statement was that what I'm um, what I'm talking about isn't based in fact. And uh, okay, uh, I do the best I can, folks. I really do the best I can to get uh, information. Um, that uh, is what I understand. And if it's being criticized, well, that's the way it goes. Um, what are the complications potentially of hydroxychloroquine and um, chloroquine? Well, interesting. Uh, you know, uh, there has been a lot of talk uh, lately about uh, research showing that the, you know, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine 
are not effective. But beyond that, we know that they're still being used in various countries. And I would say that one thing that we haven't really talked about needs to be brought out, and that is, aside from the potential cardiac complications of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, we do know that there is a risk of what is called hemolytic anemia, where your blood, red blood cells sort of uh, are destroyed. Uh, it's rare, but it can happen in people who take these drugs who happen to have an enzyme deficiency. Sorry, but it's called G6PA, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase uh, deficiency. Uh, well, guess what? That is the most common enzyme deficiency on our planet, planet affecting about 400 million people, meaning they may be at risk for hemolytic anemia if they were to take chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. Uh, so I think we need to consider that that might be an important risk. And I apologize for the jumpiness. I've noted that as well. And um, let me take a couple of more questions uh, and then we'll call it a day. I'll get back to you soon so that, and hoping that we don't have this jerkiness. Wish I could preview this. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, thank you. Thank you as well. And let's just take one more. <clears throat> what supplements do you recommend for protection? First of all, check with your healthcare provider to see what supplements are best for you. Uh, what I take myself, uh, vitamin D, a special form of B complex called methylated B vitamin, coenzyme Q10. Um, I also take something called Fisetin or as Dr. Bland pronounced it, Fisetin, F-I-E-T-I-N. Um, I take a lot of fish oil. I do take supplemental zinc and vitamin D, 5,000 IU of vitamin D works for me. Find out what dosage is best for you uh, each day. Uh, I also take a sulforaphane supplement. Make sure that I consume uh, broccoli sprouts or, or at least broccoli seeds on a daily basis. Uh, the other supplement, the, perhaps the most important supplement, is getting enough sleep. Uh, so that's very important. Uh, sorry again for jerkiness. For who, I don't know why that would be. Uh, I might try just to connect uh, again today just to see if we still have that jerkiness, if restarting uh, is an issue. But anyway, thank you everybody for joining. I'm going to end the video now. And when we post the announcement of the upcoming video, that's a good place to post questions that will give you some time to research so that I can have better answers for you. And um, again, I do my best uh, to give you the best information as I see it. Uh, and um, thank you all for spending time with me this morning. Bye for now.